The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the nail marks and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now a week later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and bring your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Good morning and of course, uh, happy, Easter. happy Easter. And today we celebrate the Feast of the Divine Mercy. We celebrate the excellent and really mysterious, unbelievable mercy of God. It is God's great joy to forgive our sins. And today we celebrate the mercy of our loving Father and the redemption we have in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> you know, I'll tell you, I feel like I'm still basking in the radiance of last week, the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It was a beautiful, it was a beautiful three days of celebration, the starkness of our Lord's passion, the symbolism of our Lord in the tomb, the resurrection of Jesus, the music, and the great celebration that we have. I hope that you are also still feeling and experiencing a little bit of this joy of who we are as an Easter people. And I tell you, last week, I was so happy, really, by the number of people that were at Mass. Uh, we had 2,200 people plus who celebrated Mass with us last week at Queen of All Saints. Normally we get about, you know, about 800 people at Mass, more or less, right? So it was a great number. It was wonderful having the church filled with all these people. I, and I know sometimes people are like, oh, those people, they only come every other, you know, twice a year, right, or something like that, and people call them the Christers, the Christmas and Easter. I tell you what, though, honestly, I don't like that term. You know, all those people who were with us last week, and I hope there are some here with us this week also, you know what name I like to give them? My brothers and sisters in Jesus. 
because we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. Perhaps if they're not coming every week, it's, not be- it's because they have not yet come to fully perceive the power of the Eucharist. But neither have any of us been able to perceive the real power of the Holy Eucharist. But I think that in reflecting on the beautiful celebration of Easter, all those people who are touched by God's presence last week, we as, you know, if we come to Mass regularly, there's a sadness that we experience on this Sunday, that there's not quite as many people here. And we miss our brothers and sisters who are not with us. And so it's a reminder for us to say, what can we do to be missionary disciples? How can we invite people to live the faith that has given us so much joy and peace? What can I do? What can you do to be a better, more intense Christian in order to spread the faith to the people that we meet in our everyday lives? Well, I think the roadmap for what we are called to do is presented to us today in sacred scripture. In the first reading from today's Mass, we get a sort of biography of the Christian church in the first century. We see a church in its vibrancy that went out and changed the world. They converted the Roman Empire. They suffered persecution. In the midst of all of it, they changed the trajectory of history because of their fidelity and their vibrancy. We are called to live that. What does the reading tell us from today's Mass? I'd like you to flip to the next uh, slide so that we can see this. this. Pope Benedict said that this is the essential component of what it means to be a Christian. These four things are the essential component of what it means to be a Christian. And this is what we hear in today's first reading. That that early church of Christian disciples, that they devoted themselves, one, to the apostles' teaching, two, to the community, three, to the breaking of bread, and four, to a life of prayer. If we are going to be missionary disciples, if we are going to live our faith and spread that faith to other people, These are the characteristics that must be part of our community of faith. These are the things that we are also called to live in order to convert the people of our time, to change the trajectory of history to a positive force of love and grace. And so I'd like to talk about these four points and how it is that we live them, how it is that the early church lived them. First of all, the early Christians devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles. They believed that what the apostles were teaching was consistent with what Jesus taught. They believed that the teaching of the apostles was a continuous line from Christ himself, the Messiah. We are called to have that same attitude to the teaching of the apostles right now in this day. That is to believe the teaching of the church, that the church has the authority and the grace to teach in line with Christ Jesus himself. (coughs) Now, there's a problem with this, I think, in our society. There are, unfortunately, uh, Catholics who even celebrate Mass regularly, even every week, who say, yes, I believe in the church, I'm Catholic, but, you know, there's a few tenets, maybe a few moral teachings of the church that I'm not really in favor of, right? So I'm Catholic, I believe the church, I believe Jesus and Christ, but these three or four points, I'm going to set those aside, and I'm not going to care about them. Well, if you find yourself in your heart not submitting to the teaching of the apostles, then you don't have the fullness of unity. And you are not, we are never going to be that vibrant community that will change the world. The first, apo- the first Christians, now there was arguments. You read the Acts of the Apostles. There's arguments, there's discussions, there was some dissension that's part of human life. But in the end, when the apostles proclaimed something, they submitted to the teachings of the apostles. Then they said, while I don't fully understand 
It is my call to grasp these truths and to submit to them. I think in our society, there are two principal problems with why we as Americans have a hard time submitting ourselves to the teaching of the church. The first is our psyche of the uh, rugged individual. And the second is that we have such a fascination with democracy that we fail to understand where truth comes from. I'd like to examine these two points with you this morning. First of all, the American idea of rugged individualism We treasure freedom so much in the United States, and this is a good thing. We treasure freedom so much that we say every man and woman is totally free to do what they want, to feel what they want, to believe what they want, to have opinions according to their own intellect, their own mind and rationale. And in a way, that's a good thing. But when this is exemplified too far, we have this attitude that I have the right to do whatever I want, to think whatever I want, and if anyone tells me something different, they're imposing upon my freedom. I have the freedom as a rugged individual to believe and have opinions as I want them, and no one can change that. So we have this idea that some old man in Rome cannot tell me what to believe, because if I follow that, I lose my freedom. But of course, that's not true freedom. True freedom is submitting to the holiness of God. True freedom is freedom from sin. True freedom is knowing and walking in the light of Christ and living in his truth. I think the second uh, difficulty that we have in our American society is this fascination with democracy. Again, democracy is a good thing, but democracy is the determination of your movement based on the voting of of the majority of persons. And so we have this notion that truth will be determined by a vote. If everyone thinks some way, if the majority of people think a particular way, then that must be truth. But we can't, of course, carry that over into the church because it doesn't matter. Even if everyone here, I said, is it night or day? And everyone raised their hand and said, it's nighttime right now. That doesn't make it so. Voting does not lead us to truth. Where does truth come from? Truth, first of all, exists in the mind of God. And then that truth is echoed in the creation of nature so that we see God's truth before us in the reality of human nature and the beauty of his created world. Further, that truth is then articulated by the church who reflects on nature and the word of God, thereby presenting us the truth that first exists in the mind of God. Truth is not determined by voting. Truth exists in the mind of God, and the reflection of the church articulates that truth to us. And the moment that we say, I don't believe what the church teaches, we place ourselves in opposition to truth. If we want to be the vibrant faith community, it means that we must submit to the word of God, submit to the teaching of the church, live in the unity of freedom so that we can present to the world a unified front of joyful hope in the freedom that comes to us in Christ. That's the first thing, that we should dedicate ourselves to the teaching of the apostles. Now, don't be too nervous. I know that first point was very long. The next points are not so long, okay? So we're going to move through the next three pretty rapidly. What else do we need to, be, to do to be missionary disciples? Next, we are called to live in community with one another. You see, I can't be a Christian without you. And you can't be a Christian without everyone else. We need each other to live the Christian faith. I was getting gas this week at a gas station, and, you know, there's TVs everywhere. There's TVs now on the the gas stations. The the wisdom of the gas station electric attendant, right? And so uh, this week in the the wisdom of the gas station electric attendant, she said, you want to know what type of person you are? Examine who are your five closest friends, and that will show you what type of person you are. I think that's pretty accurate. And so the question is, who are your friends? Who do you hang out with? Do you live with other Christians so that they are supporting you and upholding you and so that you are upholding them? Or do you live your daily life outside of the context of Christian community? We need each other. And it is only with each other that we will live the faith. We also must have non-Christian friends so that we can invite them and show them the beauty of who we are in Christ. Next, the church in the six, excuse me, the sacred scripture tells us that the early church was devoted to the breaking of the bread. We know, of course, 
that the breaking of the bread is the Holy Eucharist. It is the celebration of the Mass. Without the Holy Mass, every single Sunday, we cannot live the faith. We need Jesus in the Eucharist, in the proclamation of the world, word, and the assembly gathered to worship and praise. We must be devoted to the breaking of the bread, that is, the celebration of Holy Mass, the heart, the center, the life, the core of what it means for us to be Christians. And finally, the early Christian church dedicated themselves to prayer because what they did every Sunday here filled their hearts so completely that in their daily life, they experienced prayer constantly. They were filled with Christ in the Eucharist, and that, that filling overflowed in the rest of their days so that each and every day they lived in the presence of God and they prayed to God the Father through Jesus Christ the Lord. By these four characteristics, by their devotion to the teachings of the apostles, by the community, by the breaking of the bread, and by their life of prayer, the early Christian church changed the world. And we are called to do the same if we have fidelity to these four principles that are laid out to us. My brothers and sisters, today we celebrate the mercy of God that we have been called to this community of faith. We celebrate our life of prayer and we give thanks to God that we have been saved in Christ Jesus because the Lord Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and given us the promise of hope and the forgiveness of our sins. Alleluia, alleluia.